thrills me to know that. I don't know how I could have gotten by the rest of this day without it. <laughs> sure, I'm glad you told me. Because I'd have been wondering all night long what was Billy Graham's theme song when he came to Nashville. I'm wondering where he's going when he dies, preaching all that false doctrine. <clears throat> I don't know where men are going. I have learned just to leave it alone and let God deal with them. Because I can't figure it out. All right. We are here again. And uh, am I on there? Okay. I'm on. I guess somebody got their cup full this morning, didn't they? Their cup was overflowing. <laughs> All right. We always uh, read, share with you uh, some emails. I read most of the emails. We didn't pull them off this afternoon, but I read most of what we had. And uh, Janice Ward writes to us from Poconos, Pennsylvania. She mailed us. She watches us regular. Uh, says, hi, my family, friends, sisters, and brothers. Some of you already know that my mother recently went home to rest and wait for the Messiah, Lord Jesus Christ, at the last trump. For those of you who have not heard yet, I am sharing this announcement, which is both bitter and sweet. Sweet because mom is resting from her suffering and tests, dying in the Lord with the praises of the Lord on her lips and his word in her ears, which I know brought her so much joy and peace. Sweet because I will have an opportunity to see her again with the creator of heaven and earth, bitter because I miss her so much. And it seems that time should have stood still for us alone to be together. We thoroughly enjoyed one another's company and the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit embraced us ever so gently. On November 28, 2012, there was one taken and one left to carry on the good news. Please continue to pray for me and my family. I would like to thank all of those who have been praying for us I can feel the strength of the Lord moving upon my waters for the task at hand. Thank you for your message and comfort and compassion and care. I love you all. Rejoice, saints rejoice. Janice Ward in Poconos, Pennsylvania. We love you, Janice. Then uh, got a letter from uh, Phyllis Teal in Vider, Texas. That's just outside of Beaumont. Know where that is. Uh, hello, grace and truth. Things have been difficult for me physically, but all is better. Pastor Jim's messages have continued to reveal the Word of God any time, day or night. Thank you so much. Please continue to send the tapes. Phyllis Till, and she's in Vider, V-I-D-O-R is the way that's spelled. It's just outside of Beaumont where I went to high school. I don't know where that is. And then uh, Dan Hawk writes to us from from uh, down in Florida, down in Palm Coast, sent a little note, grace and truth, and closes a check to help Lawrence in New York and his sick daughter. We'll be getting that to him. And then uh, uh, Dwayne Germany from Birmingham, Alabama, writes to us. He used to watch us down there. We're not on down there anymore. He's got at the top of it, Bah Humbug. Okay. Dear Jim, Mary, and all of family at Grace and Truth, I pray all are in the well way. Once again, it's that season. Already tired of people wishing me Merry Christmas and them thinking what's wrong with me after I explain to them I don't celebrate Christmas and why. Sounds like it's just pointless because they really don't care to know. They will continue to celebrate it no matter how much evidence I present as to why it's wrong to do and and these are all such good Christians. Anyway, back on the June the 25th of this year, I became a grandfather. The question I get from most now, who know I don't celebrate Christmas, is what will I tell, you? What will I tell my grandchild? We tell them it's pagan, just like my grandsons that are four and five. We tell them it's pagan. They, okay, that's a real easy question to answer. I'm going to tell her the truth. That's the best thing I can present her with. Jim, continue to preach truth. I hope my walk in life will present a decent example of that same truth. Much agape and flow to you and the family. Dwayne, Germany. We love you, Dwayne. Just keep on, brother. We'll see you next time you come up. And then Ricky Canada from Portland. He goes to a charismatic church. Ricky, get out of that church or else. Not or else from me, but or else from God. 
Uh, Dear Mary, once again, is asking you to keep me on your mailing list for the wonderful DVDs. Enclosed is a small offering that I hope will help in the ministry and the building of God's kingdom. Hope you and Jim are doing well, and I wish for God's blessings to be upon you. Sincerely, Ricky Candida. Ricky, come on down and join us and quit going to that that hellish place you're going because it is charismatic and they believe God wants everybody rich and they teach lies. Uh, from Phoenix, Arizona, uh, this is from Sherry Johnson. She watches us out there faithfully. One of our dear friends, dearest family, all thoughts and prayers for you. All without ceasing, may our great God of all things continue to shower this mercy and justice upon us and strengthen us in our fiery affliction. Love you all until next time. A God can flail Sherry Johnson. And uh, she watches regular out there in Tucson, in Tucson, Arizona, as a guy used to say. And uh, Carlos De Los Santos in Houston. He used to be our representative, but he got a lot of flack from his family. He stayed with us a couple of years. Uh, dear Jim, use this however it's needed in Christ. Carlos, we love you, Carlos. Come and see us sometimes. He loves this truth. Been with us for 10, 12 years. And uh, then uh, Michael Nietzsche from Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, he writes, Dear Pastor Jim and Grace and Truth, please send and close tithe and offerings. I thank God for you and the... And something holy spirit i have a few questions are we to think of others and build up others who are not of the truth no who walk according to the flesh and world how can you build them up because what builds up that's the word edify oiko domeo agape edifies and agape is walking in god's commandments so love edifies and did saint anthony really do all those miracles? No. Being a former Catholic, I used to read about the lives of the saints of the Catholic Church, but I realize now they may have been all lies. Well, they are. Catholics don't say anything. They say Jesus resurrected, but that's the other Jesus, so even that's not true. If you're not preaching the real Jesus, you're preaching the other Jesus. This wait a minute, that's from this is Ron Mems. He's our representative from Charlotte. Just a line or two to thank you for your ministry and the teaching of the truth in the word of the gospel. Find and close a small donation to the cause. May you live long. Give everyone who shares with us my greetings. Sincerely. Uh, that's Ron Mems. And I got several other letters. They say for every letter you get, you're reaching 500 to 1,000 people. I got a bunch here, and I'm not going to read all these. Maybe just one more here. Gail Voss. And, wait a minute. She didn't write anything. She just sent her tithe. Rick and Denise Young in Tucson, Arizona. And uh, they wrote a little note as they sent their tithe in. Dear Jim Grace and Truth Ministry Family. May the Lord Jesus grant you favor, strength, and perseverance through daily struggles, trials, and tribulations. Know that as brothers and sisters, we continue to watch and pray, realizing that God is in control. He works all things for good to those children of his heart. We are lifted up by reading and studying the Holy Scriptures by the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your commitment to truth. God has made changes in our lives through the ministry. Thank you for all you do to feed those who hunger and thirst for the truth. Please continue to send us DVDs. We appreciate the time, effort everyone puts in sending out the materials. Agape and Fell, Rick and Denise Young. We love you guys. Keep watching. That'll be enough reading. Let me remind you of our regular announcements. We have uh, regular announcements, and that is that uh, we're on TV in Nashville, all over the Nashville area. On Monday night, If you're in Hendersonville, Channel 3. And uh, then we're on uh, radio every Saturday morning at uh, Saturday morning at 8 o'clock for an hour on WNQM. That's 1300 on the dial. Remember our needy people.
we have we've got some poor people that can hardly live they're just struggling to stay alive uh, people like uh, Sheila Wells down in Louisiana she makes about six hundred and seventy dollars a month and she lives on that she has to get food stamps and a little bit of government help but she never asks for anything and we try to help her and Patricia Donaldson up in uh, up in uh, uh, Hammond, Indiana, and and Leo Brigman and his wife up in Chicago, and we've got some others. Uh, uh, Amanda Meadows out in Murfreesboro. Her husband's on dialysis three times a week, and she don't even have any uh, insurance. It just piles up, and I don't know what you do. I guess declare bankruptcy one day if she can, and but she's just struggling. So we try to help these people and some more. Uh, Linda Spring down over in Arkansas, her trailer burnt down, and and she doesn't know where she's going to live. She's in her mid sixties, retired, not drawing much money, about seven hundred a month, trying to live on it. And these are not, these are not just people we can find that are poor. We can find a thousand of them down in Nashville. These are people who believe the truth, and. Uh, Now, if you send to them, put, if you send for the needy, put needy on the bottom of your check, make it out to grace and truth. Or if you, you want to put cash in an envelope, be sure and put for the needy. And we'll get 100% of that goes to them. And uh, we're trying to do what the Bible says, take care of the widow and the orphan. That is our obligation, to take care of these people that are believers, not unbelievers. Uh, then we have... Uh, uh, we have our, or you can send a, a, a gift card, um, a, a Walmart or a Visa or what have you, and we get these to them. When you think you're having a hard time, look around, okay? Just look around. You're not having a hard time. There's some people I know are having a hard time. All right. It's good to see everybody. It's good to see you, Brooks. Hey, Marcel, how you doing? What are y'all doing? Just here to watch? See the show? I like your show. Da -da 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 -da. People call me and tell me they like the show, and I'll usually do a tap dance about that time. All right. It's good to see everybody. There's restrooms back here, and there's water back there in the back. Well, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. It's Sunday night, and we've been on a study in the doctrine of the devil for about two and a half years. It is without a doubt that the word devil or the word demon is not in the New Testament. It is the word, uh, you got two words that are translated over to the word demon. Uh, excuse me, that's translated over to the word devil. In a King James Bible, you have the word devil every time it's speaking of the devil. You don't have the word demon in, in a King James Bible. You have one of two words, diabolos, which is the same in, in Italian or Spanish or Greek. And then, and then you have the word D-A-I-M-O-N. I O N. And that's the word daemonion. And daemonion comes from the word daemon, D A I M O N, which is our word demon. There is no such thing as demons. That is another one of those twisted fairy tales. What are demons? Demons are self. They are self. If you notice, Jesus never did say anything along the lines of, any man will come after me, let him deny his demon. And take up his cross and follow me, did he? 
didn't say that. He said, let him deny himself. It doesn't say himself. It just says self in the text. Let, let him deny self. Well, Jesus says that demons are self. You have to understand, when you're reading the Bible, you got to look at who's telling the truth. There's a lot of lies in the Bible. You know that, don't you? I didn't say the Bible is a lie. There's lots of men in the Bible telling lies. Evil men all through the Bible will tell lies in the Old Testament. Uh, and people will, they'll question Jesus. And when they question Jesus, and they come up and say something, then Jesus says something. They question Jesus. And they question Jesus. And then Jesus says something. And then men around, the Pharisees that are around, they comment. And this happens in Mark, the first chapter, Mark 1. Well, Jesus comes upon a man in the temple. The Bible says he has an unclean spirit. Unclean spirit. Well, if you're studying... Matthew, Mark, Mark, Luke, John. You'll have uh, various accounts. You might have the same account in Matthew and Mark. Then you'll have an account of another happening in Mark and Luke. Then you'll have another account of, in Matthew and John. But you have to remember, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these are the synoptic Gospels because they have a synonymous view and it's merely Matthew's account of something that happened, Mark's account of something that happened, and Luke's account of something that happened. If you only read one of them, one of them's account, you're not going to come up and find out the truth. But if you're reading Mark, the first chapter, about the man that has an unclean spirit, and you read the fourth chapter of Luke about the, about the man who has an unclean demon... It actually says unclean devil in the, in the English, but it is the word unclean daemonion. So if you read over here, and he's got an unclean spirit, well, look there in Mark, the first chapter. I keep quoting it, but let's just read it together. Here in Mark, the first chapter, Mark 1. And when you're reading, you've got to read Matthew's account in Luke's account, so you can see what's being said. All right. And there was, in verse 23, Mark 1, there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Now, unclean spirit, the word spirit is pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A. Well, the word pneuma is breath. And they've translated it spirit, but it's breath. So he has an unclean, a katharos, A-K-A-T-H-A-R-O-S. We get our word cauterize from katharos, and it means, and to cauterize means to clean something, placing the alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, as the alpha primitive. It negates the word. It means no cleanness to the breath. Now, it doesn't mean the guy has halitosis. That's not what it's talking about. It means that he's got... What he's looking out for is the unclean breath, and that's the, that's the physical human being that's got, he breathes air. But all of this air that we breathe is unclean, and we never expel all of the carbon dioxide. We got little uh, sacs in our lungs that never expel all of it. So actually what it's saying, a man has an unclean spirit. He's looking out for this body. He's not looking out for spiritual things. Do you have a clean spirit? Clean spirit would be holy spirit. Holy spirit, and holy is the word hagios. It means pure. Pure or clean. Clean spirit. So the opposite of unclean spirit is going to be clean spirit or holy spirit. And what's the holy spirit? Truth. So this man... The Bible is saying he doesn't have any truth in his life. 
The Holy Spirit's truth, John 14, 15, 16, John 15, 26, John 16, 13, 1 John 5 and 6. The Spirit is the truth. I'll write it up there. John 14, 15, 16. Now, if the Pentecostals would read the Bible thoroughly and pay attention, they wouldn't believe there's something called the Holy Ghost that makes you speak in, in jibber-jabber or gibberish. John 15, 26. John 16, 13, 1 John 5, 6. Every one of these verses say the Spirit is truth. Or it'll say even the Spirit of truth over there in 15, 26. It, it tells you that the Spirit is truth. So the man has an unclean spirit, but over here in Luke 4... Let's just read that one more time. Look here. In, there was a, in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. Now, do you actually think that at this point when he begins to cry out that he's got good sense? He doesn't have any truth in him. Is, is whatever he's going to say, is that going to make any sense? Now, whatever he says, he's going to say a lie simply by the words that he uses. And Jesus is going to have to correct him. When I say there's lies in the Bible, I don't mean the Bible's a lie. There's a lot of people lying in the Bible. Nimrod was lying. Ahab was lying. Jehoram was lying. Gosh, most of these kings were lying. They were kings of Israel, weren't they? Huh? There's a lot of lies in the Bible, but it don't mean the Bible's a lie. It means there's a bunch of liars in there telling lies that, that the prophets are, try, are correcting them, and they paid no attention to them. They're not listening to Jesus. Yet, how can I say that? When stories are being told in the Bible, everything that's said is not necessarily true because you got some guy lying and then you got Jesus correcting him, right? Well, here's how the man lies. And he says, let us alone. What have we to do with thee? Well, he uses plural. That's a plural pronoun, we. That means more than one. It's plural. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth, Act thou, art thou come to destroy us? He keeps saying, now the Jews, you got to remember, they said that demons came in, they came in legions. A legion at one time was 3,000, and then there was, at one point, it grew to 7,000, depend, uh, 6,000, and that's just depending on how many people they had in a legion in the Roman army. It, they would change the number in a legion or like a company in, in the United States Army. So he says, Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee. Who, then he goes back to I. He goes back to one. I know you. I know thee. Who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him. Now, if Jesus rebukes him, evidently he's wrong. Isn't he? <laughs> now, Jesus rebukes. Now, he's got an unclean spirit. Jesus rebukes A-U-T-O. That's the word right there. You got two O's in the Greek. You have an omega, which sounds like our O. O is the way it sounds. You have an omicron, which sounds like an A, ah, like not, not. And this sounds like an O over here. Well, that omega, when Jesus rebukes him, it's pronounced auto, just like our word auto, automobile. When they vented the, when they quit having horses pull the buggies, they said, we're going to have to get something that's self-mobile. And they built a little box with an engine in it and called it a car or an auto, a self-mobile. You see, auto is a Greek word, it's self. So Jesus rebukes self. That's what he rebukes, doesn't he? If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Well, let's, and then he says, Jesus rebuked him, hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him, now you say, what in the world is an unclean spirit tearing somebody? The word is sparasso, S-P-A-R-A-S-S-O. Sparasso 
It means spasmodic contraction or mangled or tear to convulse. Now, if a demon, the word daemonion means to distribute fortunes. When you get real frustrated in the world, I have been frustrated. I wanted to be famous. I wanted to be rich. I want everybody to look at me. And I got extremely frustrated, got all bent out of shape. You know what bent is, don't you? That's an idiom. <laughs> I thought I'd just throw it at you. We talk about idioms all the time. I was bent out of shape. One time I was living down here in, in Inglewood, and I had a music group, and we were doing shows around the country and going to colleges and working with some stars and stuff. And I was all just, just, I was trembling all the time and shook, and I was about half crazy. And I made the comment, I had an old dog named Susie, and she was 17 years old. And I told my band as we was rehearsing, I said, if Susie had in her, what I got in me, she'd kill herself. That's not natural for a human being to put himself or herself under that kind of stress. That is not worth any amount of money. I don't care what you're doing. And I know that now at 73. That's easy to understand. I couldn't understand it at 35 or 30 or 25. I, I insist I got to be somebody. And you get spasmodic, don't you? You get sparasso and you begin to tear your body. Have I ever hit the wall with my fist? Oh, a thousand times. Have I ever busted the drywall? Has anybody been guilty of that? <laughs> I used to sell houses and I would go into a house and it'd have a hole in the wall. Now I recognize a fist hole in the wall. I know what they look like. Somebody said, well, somebody fell and bumped their head on that. No, you got mad and you punched a hole in the drywall. I know what that's like. That's what this man had. He was mad and bent. <laughs> I can't have my way. <laughs> Does that ever happen to you? I can't be who I want to be. And that's what distributing fortunes and money will do to you. We are supposed to be content with such things as we have, but we usually have to get old to learn that. <laughs> when, as I've gotten old, it's fun being old. It's not fun being young. I'm sorry to say that, but it's more fun being old, isn't it, Marcella? Now, I'm not calling you old, but you're old enough to know what I'm talking about, aren't you? It's, it's bad to be young and trying to climb the ladder of success and you can't get there because God's keep beating you down. It's a bad place to be. Besides that, not, not where God called us to be. Now let's go over here. Let's go over to... Now wait a minute, I'm going to through here. When he had torn him and cried with a loud voice, it doesn't say he came out of him. It just says came out of him in the original text. And they were all amazed insomuch that they questioned among themselves saying... What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commandeth, command, with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. Well, this is what the people standing around said. They said he, un, he commandeth the unclean spirits, unclean spirits, and they used in the text, they use, you go into the interlinear Bible, you pull the word out, the, exactly the way it's spelled in the Greek text. This is how you find out. Here's the Greek on the top line, right under the English. So you get the exact spelling in the original text, and you go to an analytical lexicon. I've got one right here. I've got several of them at home. Here's one. And you open it up, and it'll tell you what gender it is, he'll tell you what person it is. You've got to learn your Greek alphabet and then you can look it up. So here's, they said he had an unclean spirit and you, they use neuter, gender, plural. Plural. When they said that, they lied. That's one of the lies in the Bible. Because Jesus rebuked him and Jesus said, he was masculine gender, singular. So they lied, didn't they? What they said wasn't true. What Jesus said was true, and the man himself said, we. Well, which one are you going to believe? The man, the people standing around, or Jesus? 
Uh, you, you believe Jesus, don't you? You see there are lies in the Bible? I didn't say the Bible is a lie. When the Bible says that somebody is saying something, and the way they would show, the way Jesus was saying there's no such thing as demons, the way he said that, he rebuked the man. But they said demons came in droves upon a man and he had them all in his body and they would make him sick or they'd bring him to good fortunes. What the Jews called demons, what the Jews called demons, and these were gods, it's what they were, little G, excuse me. These were gods and the demons began at Babel. All these were Babel. And this is where the fire worship or Christmas or Christ mass started. Fire worship started. And the demons were the gods. It was a deification of Nimrod, the queen of heaven, this mythical goddess, a Semiramis, or, or whoever she was, she was queen of heaven. She was the female deity, and all this was was a deification of these into demons, and that was Hercules and Venus and Adonis and Achilles and all the rest, and Tammuz and all the rest of these Greek and Roman gods of the ancient world. Demon, they didn't have demons. They had self in them. So when the Jews, when you said something to the Jews, they said demons were entities that came into their bodies, and Jesus said, no, they're self. He said, your problem is you. You're saying because you're getting bent out of shape and you can't have the things you want and you're getting, becoming a basket case, that it's something coming into you. It's something that's already in you. It's called the lust of the flesh. So what the Jews called demons, the Arabs called genies, and they all said, they all said, they all said these were their ancestors. This is ancestor worship. Ancestors. Hercules was nothing but Nimrod. And all the rest of these male deities were Nimrod. And the female deities was the queen of heaven. And they were represented in the form of the tree, which is the Christmas tree. And that's what the, that's what the Celts call fairies. And you get wishes from a fairy, you get wishes from a genie, you get three wishes from the genie, don't you? And you get wishes from a demon, according to the Jews, they would lead you good fortunes. That's what the, that is also what the Greeks called guardian angels. And what do you get from a guardian angel? You get good fortune, he leads you to good things, fairies lead you to good things, genies lead you to good things, and genie comes from the word gene. Gene, and that's your ancestors. They said your ancestors coming down and inhabiting your body. The American Indian called them totems. The totem pole was the ancestors, and they had their ancestors in the form of a wolf, or in the form of an otter, or the form of an eagle, and they would come down and indwell your body. And Jesus said, none of that's true. None of it. The way he said it, he'd change the gender on a word. He didn't have to say there's no such thing as demons. The Bible would just say, and he rebuked him. That's the way he says it's not true. Simply changing the gender, changing the person from singular, plural, or plural to singular. That's the way he would, he would do that. So these are some lies that's in the Bible. Look over here in Luke. Look at Luke's account. Luke, this is one of the best definitions of demons in all the Bible. In Luke 4. The problem, you see, if you can get it off of men's mind that the problem is them, then they can blame it on a devil and say, the devil made me do it now. Cast the devil out of me and I get to go out and start working on my career once again and working on my distributing fortunes. I wanted to get rich in real estate. And I was capable of doing it. I could make lots of money doing it. But God kept me sick all the time till he put me in the hospital and nearly killed me. And that's what he'll do to you. And then he gave me a heart attack. I had heart surgery and had cancer surgery. And he, well, it's amazing. Since I quit wanting things and stuff, I'm healthy at 73 and I was dying at 44. I was a dying man at 44 years old. My wife will tell you that. In and out of the hospital constantly with bronchial pneumonia. I don't have bronchial pneumonia no more. I don't fight breathing anymore. I don't cough and hack and spit. 
like I did 15 years ago when y'all were coming. I don't do that no more. You know why? God changed my mind to quit seeking the flesh. And I'm not concerned about that anymore. I'm concerned about today, teaching somebody today. When I wake up in the morning, it's not wanting to know how many houses I can sell, how much money I can make, or whether I can be a star or not. It's seeking the truth in the Lord. Let me tell you, it's really hard to get a hold of this. But when Jesus said, I'm with you all the way to the end of the world, he actually meant that. But when you're with yourself, you're into yourself, and you're beside yourself. That's what Festus told Paul. And when we're beside ourselves, our lives are a wreck, aren't they? If I could teach you how to be 65, that would help you a lot. If you can just get be 65, all of a sudden in mind, keep your young body, just be 65, you'd act completely different. But I'm sorry, you have to wait till you get there. Don't you? It don't happen overnight. Now, look at the same man in Luke 4. This is Luke's account of the same man. In verse 33, and in the synagogue, same words, in the synagogue, this is Jesus coming to the synagogue with the same man. There was a man which had the spirit of an unclean demonion. Demon. Well, if he's an unclean demon over here, and he's an unclean spirit over here, and Jesus said itself, then itself in Matthew 1 and in Luke 4, isn't it? It's still self. That's the only problem a man has, is self. Now, we've gone through the demoniac of Luke 8, Luke 8, and Mark 5, Five in Matthew 8. There's a man that's, he is a demoniac dwelling among the tombs, and the Bible says that he is possessed with devils right before the casting out of devils. Possessed with devils. Possessed with devils is possessed with demonion. But possessed with devils is only one word in the Greek. It's the word daimonizomai. D-A-I-M-O-N-I-Z-O-M-A-I. Word endings are changed depending on the character of the word. This word daimonizomai means to be insane. Do you know that insanity is mostly frustration in a man's mind because he can't have his way? So it makes him want to go jump off the deep end and do crazy things to his body and cut his body. And this man was dwelling among the tombs, cutting on his body and screaming and yelling and getting crazy. That ain't nothing but self. That will drive you off the deep end. Has that ever happened to you? You ever been frustrated? Because you couldn't have what you wanted, couldn't have the money you want, the house you want, the car you want, the job you want, the fame you want, the fortune you want, and everything that you want? Is anybody guilt here besides me? Everybody's guilty, I know that. There's no temptation taken me, but such as is common to man. I know what's in everybody's hearts here. The reason I know is because I've admitted what's in mine. Now, I know what's in yours. All you have to do is repent of it daily. I know what's in everybody's heart. Once God lets you confess that and admit it's in your heart and you've had to wrestle with it and get over it, and repentance is daily. The word repent, metanoia, except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Metanoia means to be turned. You cannot turn yourself. To be turned and to think differently. Jeremiah said, Lord, turn thou me and I shall be turned. And after I was turned, I repented. And I got ashamed of myself. If you've never been ashamed, you sin. You hadn't really repented. And that is present tense subjunctive mood when he said that in Luke 13, 3. Present tense subjunctive mood means over and over and over. And you have to turn from self daily because you go back to self daily. Until after you get older, you just kind of start to turn back and you say, that's the wrong direction. And you just keep going straight. 
You get old enough, you realize seeking self is a dead-end street for believers. It's dead-end. There is no easy way to say it. It's the wrong place to go. Best thing to do, if I say this, when you're young, it's nearly impossible to understand it. Live for the Lord. That's the best way. That'll solve all your problems if you live for Christ. Now, that sounds like some real religious thing some old guy is saying. And I'm an old guy, and that's a real religious thing. But it's the truth. It's the only thing that will make your life happy. Nothing else will. So there is no such thing as demons. The man has an unclean dam on here, and he says all the same things to Jesus. In verse 35, says Jesus rebuked him. He rebuked self. Now, I've said this over and over. Demons are self. That's the desire for fortunes. The word daemonion means to distribute fortunes. I've read these verses, but let's go back. Now, there's two doctrines in the Bible. There's the doctrine of the devil and the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of the devil is fulfill the flesh, fulfill self, and the doctrine of Christ is crucify self. That's it. There's no other doctrines in the Bible. Doctrine is the word didache or didascalia. Do you know the reason people are frustrated? If anybody here has been frustrated, and I know you have, it's just you. That's the only problem. You, you want to blame everybody but you. When I ended up in the hospital at 44 years old and I thought I was dying, and I, you've heard me give this testimony. I sat over up on the side of the bed and looked out at New Shackle Island Road with IVs in my arms, and, and I didn't think I was going to come through that. And I sat there, and for the first time in my life, I said, Lord, the fault is mine. I had blamed real estate moguls. I had blamed music promoters and music labels and, and people around the country because I couldn't get on top of the world. I blamed them. Were they doing evil things? Yes. Were they supposed to do evil things? Yes. They were supposed to do them to me. God says, I'm going to raise up a sword against my people. And David said, Lord, deliver me from the wicked, which is your sword in your hand, which you raised up to cut me down. They're supposed to cut you down when you're a believer. They're not supposed to help you up. You're not one of them. If you are of the world, the world will love his own. But you're not of the world. You're not supposed to be able to climb their ladder. It amazes me how stupid I was when I was young. I went over here to the world's ladder. And I was climbing up the ladder. And I couldn't understand why some guy up here on the ladder kept stepping on my hands, kept kicking me off the ladder. Well, he's of the world, and that's his ladder. And he made the rules. That's his ballpark, his ball game, his ball, his bat. And he set the rules. And you cannot go out there and play with the world and be a good Christian. Did you know that? It can't be done. I'm here to tell you after I've gotten old, it can't be done. You can't do it. Not as a believer. God will have you kicked off the ladder. He'll have them throw you out of the ballpark and you'll blame them because he's over there playing with them and trying to play their game with a different set of rules. It don't work. And it don't matter whether it's music or whether it's the fire department, like Ken, it's all politics, isn't it, Ken? Amen. Everything is politics out there in the world. It's a political game. Don't matter if it's being in school, being a teacher, or if it's being a principal. You have to work your way up by playing games with people. That's what the world, it's about winning friends and influencing people. But if you win friends of the world, what does that make you? Enemy of God, James 4 and 4. You adulteresses and adulteresses, know you not that friendship with the world is enmity against God, and whosoever be a friend of the world is the enemy of God? Enmity is the word ekthra, E-C-H-T-H-R-A. It means hostile. If you get along with the world, you are hostile to God. You can't get along with the world. I'm not talking about going and making enemies with them. But if you take a stand for Christmas is pagan, Easter is pagan, God does not love everybody, predestination is true, 
and tell people they have to take their cross and die daily, debt to self, self-denial, they're not going to like you. Your family ain't going to like you. Are they supposed to like us? No. Jesus said a man's foes will be those of his own household in Matthew the 10th chapter. And didn't Jesus say, if the world hated me, it'll hate you. If it persecuted me, it'll persecute you. The, the answer to the question is, did they hate Jesus? Oh, gosh, they killed him for his words. Yeah, they hated him. And they're going to hate us, too. So if you're not hated yet, you got a lot of growing to do. Now, they hate me, I guarantee you. I get on TV and hammer and blast Nashville and blast about 200 towns and cities around the country. I'm blasting Los Angeles. I'm just unloading on Fort Worth and Dallas and Houston and Beaumont and San Antonio and Waco and Austin and Texas. We're trying to load everything we can down in Texas. In Tulsa and Oklahoma City, and they, we're unloading on New York City and Washington, D.C. and Atlanta. And there's people call me and cuss a blue streak threatening my life. If I could get a hold of you, you mister, you blankety, 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 blank. I even got some of them saved on my phone at home. You will listen to them. Whew. Some people call me every name under the sun. They don't like the idea that I say God doesn't love everybody. And they'll get on the phone and start cussing me. I want to say I would like to. I wish I was answering the phone. I said, did you learn that in Sunday school? Since you hate this so much, you think God loves everybody? Goodness gracious alive. If you're friends of the world, you're an enemy of God. If you can get popular in the world, if you get popular, Luke 6, 26 says, says that, that if you're popular, well, look here. Let's just read this. Look at this. I guess I need to have you read some of these things. Look here. In Luke 6, and look at verse 22 first, and then look at verse 26. Now, this is a very sobering thought, very sobering. 22, excuse me, 6, not 22. Where am I thinking of? Luke 6, Luke 6, 22. Luke 6, 22. Blessed are ye, Mercurios. That's the word blessed. It's the same word as the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the so forth. It's all the blessed. It means fortunate. You're very fortunate if the world hates you. When they separate you from their company because they don't like what you're saying and it's your family members, they say, look, you can come over to the house, but you can't talk about Christmas being pagan. We're going to have a Christmas. We're having Christmas this year. Well, Christmas is Christ's Mass. You, it's Roman Catholicism. You're not supposed to be doing it unless you're a Roman Catholic. And shall reproach you. You're blessed if you're reproached. On Idzo. O-N-E-I-D-I-Z-O. <laughs> Infamous. You're not supposed to be famous. That was my problem. I wanted to be famous, but I didn't want to be infamous. That's where you've, you're considered, well, you go to a cult. You go out to Jim Brown. You might as well be called Al Capone, hadn't you? I guarantee you, your mother would rather you'd run with Al Capone's gang than believe in predestination, take her Christmas away from her. She would rather you'd be said, I've had people come here and tell me, my mother wouldn't mind if I was dealing drugs. I think Dave said that. She'd rather be, I'd be on drugs than be in this. Right? They'd rather you'd be on drugs than believe in predestination where God doesn't love everybody. Just take some drugs, get high on some pot, and I can handle that, but I can't handle this truth out of the Bible. So, if you're, bless you when you're infamous when people hate you when they throw your cast out your name out and say that jim brown that no count low down boy i've had woman i got one woman saved on there boy she is cussing every cuss word you can think of and that's amazing you tell them the truth and they'll cuss you and then he says down here in verse 26 woe unto you now woe is a cry of grief it's a cry of damnation woe unto you 
when all men speak well of you and you're popular and you're famous and the world likes you. It's a cry of grief after you. Better get unfamous. What warn you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. The people in the Old Testament, Israel, like the false prophets, they said, no, no, no. There was a man named Hanani. And Hanani came to the people of Israel when Jeremiah was saying, God's going to destroy Israel. He's going to bring Nebuchadnezzar in and level this town and level this place and carry off into Babylon. And Hanani said, no. That's not going to happen. And if it does, you'll only be over there two years. And Jeremiah said, you're going to be there 70 years. Said, no, 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 no. You're not going to be. And God told Jeremiah, you tell Hanani, I'm going to kill him before this year is over. And he did. God will kill a man for false teaching. Do you know that false doctrine, we're talking about the doctrine of the devil. False doctrine is the one thing that God didn't put up with over in the Old Testament. If in the Old Testament, God went after the preachers of Israel. Certainly he went after the priests of Baal. But the priests of Baal were not the priests of Baal of other countries. They were the Levites who started offering offerings to Baal. They were Israelite priests of Baal. God didn't have anything against Moab which is southern Jordan, or Ammon, which is northern Jordan, with their Shemash gods and their Molech gods. That wasn't the point. It's when they brought their gods into Israel, and the Levites, the priests of Israel, started offering sacrifices to these gods. It was Israel being polluted that God was upset with. It was not whether these pagans out here. If you notice, Jesus never attacked the pagans in the New Testament. He attacked the Pharisees, didn't he? Why did he attack the Pharisees? because of their halakha. That's why everything that's evil twists God's words, makes things, makes everything nice. Let me put that up here. Let me just put Pharisees and halakha up here because I've got to read a couple of words to you. Pharisees, halakha. That was what, why Jesus attacked the Pharisees. He did not attack the prostitutes. He did not attack robbers and thieves he had a thief on the cross he didn't attack them he didn't attack the prostitutes at the temple of Dinah up here at Ephesus he didn't attack the temple prostitutes over here at the temples in Corinth they had temple prostitutes to suck the man in to the into their religion but he didn't attack them he, he never did attack the gods over here you never heard him mention Zeus or Jupiter did you he would say, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, actors, hypocrites, hypocrite. Hippocrates was an actor. That's what they called their stage actors. It was an actor wearing a mask, and he was assuming a character. He was saying, you have assumed the character of believers. And you're not. The reason, it's not because he just didn't like them. It wasn't because they were living these real wild lives of getting drunk. They did twist the word of God to have their way. They twisted it. They twisted the word. God's word. To fit their lifestyle so they could have more of self more demon in their life more distributing fortunes the reason men twist the word of God is because they want their own flesh you can sit and twist the word all day long if you want to but at the judgment it's going to get untwisted and you're going to get twisted right to hell and God's people are going to untwist the word of God because God's going to work in their lives to see to it that they untwist it before I get into the Pharisees, let's look at two verses. I very seldom read these. I just quote them to you. But let's look at them. Go over here to 1 John. 1 John. Now, this is distributing fortunes. If demon means to distribute fortunes or daemonion, and that's ancestor worship, means to distribute fortunes. 
That's what it means. Is not the love of money the root of all evil? Love of money. Isn't that the root of all evil? Didn't that add over in 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter? Love of money is one word in the Greek. One word. Philogoria. It comes from two words, philos and augury. Philos means an affection for. Augury means shining or silver. The only reason man wants silver or money or dollars is so he can shine above others with his big diamond ring, with his fancy car, with his fancy house. He, the only reason he wants applause is so he can be lifted up. Isn't that it? There's nobody wanted applause more than me, and there's no high. There's no drug in the world like being on stage and getting applause. Ain't no drug like that. Not I've ever felt. That's as high as it gets. And it's a drug. It's because you want that applause and want people to notice you. It's not any difference in getting the new Mercedes in the home of the lake. No different. Well, men who want to shine, the Bible says, God resisteth the proud in James, the fourth chapter, and First Peter, the fifth chapter. God resisteth the proud. Resist, antitasomai, means to wage war with. Wage war with the proud. Hupere, H-U-P-E-R-E-P-H-A-N-O-S. Hupere phanos comes from hooper, meaning above. That's our word super. Superman means above man. That's what it means. Hooper and Phanos. Phanos. Phanos means to shine. This is the word God resists the proud. Those people who shine above others, God is at war with them. And how do you shine? Awards things, stuff. Look at what I've got. Give me applause. See how good I am? I always think of the verse, my, I guess my favorite verse concerning all of this in 1 Corinthians 4 and 7. Who makes you to differ from another? What makes you different? Are you handsome because of something you did? Are you pretty because of something you did? Are you beautiful because of your doing? Most real beautiful people are idiots. You know that, don't you? They never ever learn to think. Just see my face? I don't have nothing between here and here, but if you notice, they have real dead looks in their eyes. That, I'm not saying nobody here is beautiful. <laughs> if you are, <laughs> you got problems. <laughs> uh, what was I? Oh. Who makes you to differ from another? And what dost thou have that thou didst not receive? Your looks, your talent, your ability, your ability to play a guitar, a piano, to sing, your ability to catch a pass, your ability to be a great quarterback, your ability to be a great running back, your ability to be a great basketball player. And you can outdo everybody else. What do you have you didn't get from God? That's what he's saying. What do you have you didn't receive from God? And if thou didst receive it from God, why are you taking the glory as though you didn't get it from God? That's why God says, don't you take the glory. You go over here and pick up the uncomely parts of the body of Christ. Raise them up when you win the trophy. Give it to them and tell people to cheer for this poor person instead of you. Does anybody have a problem with that? When you win, do you want to go find the poor, needy, downtrodden person and raise them up and say, don't clap for me, clap for them? I don't think stars do that of any kind, do they? No, they don't. I've known a bunch of them, and most of them, all the stars I've ever known are idiots, just stupid jerks. You know that, don't you? All of them I've ever around, fools, I've never heard one of them talking about a daily cross and self-denial. Have you? No. Now, look here in... 
1 John. When you're talking about distributing fortunes, which is what a demon is, this is a verse you're talking about. Now, I quote it, but I'm not going to quote it. I'm going to read it to you so you can see this. 1 John 2, 16. When distributing fortunes is the meaning of the word demon in itself, this verse right here is a verse that's going to tell you what distributing fortunes is. For all that is in the world, here's everything that's in the world. Well, if you're going to distribute fortunes, you're going to distribute what it says here, aren't you? All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, it is of the world. Lust of the flesh. This is what men go after. Lust of the eye. Pride of life. There is nothing out there that's wicked and evil that you won't find under this heading. One, two, three. How many wishes you get from a genie? You get three. Genie comes from gene. And the gene is our ancestors. Do we actually have a genie in us? Do we have genes in us? Do we have anything from our ancestors that makes us want to distribute fortunes? Do we? Do you have flesh that you receive from your ancestors and the lust of the flesh that dates all the way back to Eve? That's the only way you've got your ancestor in you is you've got them in you just like I've got Harless Brown in me. You can see that because when you look in the mirror, I see his face. And I hear his voice with that real sharp edge when I'm preaching or listening to myself, and that's what he sounded like. Well, when you have that lust of the flesh, it didn't just come from your father. It came from your grandfather, your great-grandfather, your great-great-grandfather, your great-great-great, all the way back to Adam and Eve. That's the only way we've got our ancestors in it. And do we worship our ancestors? Well, we worship this flesh. Does men worship the flesh? You see, if you tell somebody, deny self and take up the cross and follow me, or you cannot be my disciple, people don't want to hear that. They don't mind having a demon that go to some Pentecostal church, well, come out, thou foul spirit, and it gets out and crawls off across the floor or something. Looks like that thing out of the alien, you know. <laughs> That's not a demon. That's a little piece of plastic thing they use for the movie here's everything that's a demon right there demon lust of the flesh lust epithumia to long for that which is forbidden it actually comes from thumos which means to breathe hard after breathe hard epi means to superimpose or cover your life with breathing hard after something. I just got to have that. I got to have that, that, that car, that house. I got to have that girl. I got to have that applause. I got to have that fame. I got to have that fortune. I got to have that money. I'll do anything to get it. I know what it's like to be in that kind of position. I was in that position for years until it nearly killed me. Well, that's the doctrine of the devil. Where did the doctrine of the devil begin? Genesis, the third chapter. Look at it. Genesis 3. Eve looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And here's what she saw. God says, thou shalt not eat of this tree. In chapter 2, verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. When we partake of self, we die spiritually. And Eve comes to the tree. Verse 6, chapter 3. When Eve, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Good for food. It would fulfill the lust of the flesh. When she saw that it was pleasant to the eye. The lust of the eye. Pleasant the eye. And she saw a tree that would make her wise. And she could be proud. 
In the New Testament, Greek, in 1 John 2, 16, that word pride, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and that pride is alazonia, A-L-A-Z-O-N-I-A. It means self-esteem. When you get all this applause and all these awards, have people looking up to you. When you start standing for truth, it don't matter what you're wearing. They ain't going to care whether you got on a new suit or not. They don't care whether your suit costs a thousand dollars when you start telling them Christmas is pagan, Easter's pagan. That's why all through the summer I wear cutoffs and I wear a shirt always with something on it. God does not love everybody. Predestination is true. If you don't believe that, you're Antichrist. I got all kinds of shirts. I got some that says uh, the Big Dipper is the reason for the season. I preached on that this morning. I got got them that says if faith healing were true, then people wouldn't die of old age, and that's true. Because when you die of old age, you die of a disease, don't you? So you should be able to, there should be people walking around on the earth 2,000 years old. When you wear a thing, when I wear shirts out like that and I see some old real estate mogul, when I was a high roller and they were a high roller, they, we usually walked up to each other and say, I did this last week and I did this and I sold five houses and I closed four and I made $10,000 last week. What did you make? Well, I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that and that's all they talk about. It's all about self. Don't you just hate to watch those talk shows where we have those stars and guests? What are you doing? What's your movie? Well, I'm doing this movie and that movie and this movie and me and my eye and self. That's all it's about, isn't it? It's disgusting. When you find out what those people are like, you quit admiring them. You don't want to be like them. I don't want to be like them. They're jerks. All of them I ever, and I did a vocal I did vocal backup behind a whole slew of them. Worked with a bunch of the stars out there on the road. Most of them I ever met didn't have sense. God gave a wild, blind goose in a snowstorm. Can't find their way out of a wet paper sack. I don't like being around them. I don't like being around high rollers of any kind. I don't care whether they're super rich people because I know that God gave them whatever ability they had in business to do that, and they're not going to give him any glory, and they're going to go to hell one day. Most people are going to hell. Many are going to go into the Broadway, the wide gate and the Broadway, and few are going to find the narrow way. So this is the doctrine of the devil. It's all that's in the world. So that's what demon means. We've been talking about what do you do to sell people on your doctrine if you want to stay religious, if you want to stay religious and you want, the, you want all that's in the world, how do you manage to do that and stay religious? Well, you twist the Word of God. When you twist the Word of God, the Old Testament calls that froward. When you look at the word froward in your concordance, or pervert, or perverse, what men will do, they will take, they will take certain verses and they will twist them. I was reading this week uh, in one of Mr. Turnbull's books about old ancient customs and culture and he was talking about roads he said all the roads if you for instance if you lived in rome all the roads belong to the king and the king there's an old saying all roads lead to rome and that was true when rome was ruling and they had the appian way the main road that led to rome appian way and all these roads were owned by the kings, and they were kept up by the kings. And they were, they were for the kings to go into foreign lands and take their armies and to conquer them. Most people who lived out here in a little town like Jerusalem, they didn't have highways going anywhere. Whenever the Bible says there would be a man on the highway, it was an old rough uh, pathway with stumps and rocks all in it. And when the Bible says that we're to make straight the highway of the Lord in the desert for the Lord, that's what the kings did. And all the ways, all of the ways belong to the king. Well, what you do when you want to have the things and stuff of the world, you just twist the word of God. Probably, if, you're, if you've been in around the charismatics, the charismatics, one of their favorite verses is there in 3 John 2. They twist it to mean something that it doesn't mean. Third John 2, John says to Gaius, I wish above 
all things. Now, what do you think John is going to wish for Gaius? Material things above all things? He says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Now, men will take the English word. They won't go back to the Greek text and find out what that means because it doesn't make any sense in the English. I wish above all things that you get rich and you have the health of an Olympic athlete. That makes no sense. You mean God wishes that above your being in the narrow way? You taking it across daily and dying daily? He wishes that you get rich and have money? No. We've, what you do is you can keep God's word in your life. As long as you twist it and make it mean something, it doesn't mean. And the charismatics will say, see, God wants you rich and he wants you healthy. And if you send Kenneth Copeland your money, your money, then you'll be rich and healthy. Now, it always gets me, how did he get his name in there? How did he get... Let me read that. Let me see if I can see it. Maybe I missed it. You think? Did I miss his name in there? Let me see here. Third John 2. Beloved, I, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Yours truly, Kenneth Copeland. No, I don't think, I don't think it says that, does it? Well, they'll say, see... And they stick their name in there. You've got to send money to Kenneth Copeland. If, if the Bible actually meant money and physical health, why can't we send our money to the poor and be rich and healthy? Huh? Instead of Kenneth Copeland and Fred Price and T.D. Jakes and all these guys, why can't I give it to people who are really in need and then get rich and healthy? Huh? Except it don't mean money and it don't mean health. The word prosper is the word U O D O O. That is a construction of two words, U and Hodos. Hodos is the common Greek word way, highway. It's talking about a well way. This word U is well. Well, this is the same word. When Mr. Turnbull talks about all these roads belong to the king. The little cities didn't have any busy roads going out of them. This was so the king could conquer the armies. And we're, we're supposed to make straight a highway in the desert for our God. When John the Baptist came, he came preparing the way, the hodos. And the Bible says there is a narrow way, a narrow way, the word is hodos, and that there is a broad way. And many are going into the broad hodos, and few are going into the narrow hodos. So when narrow is the word thalibo, means to crowd through a narrow opening and be pressured on all sides by people, it's like being reproached and having our name cast out as evil. And it comes to the word thalipsis, which is the common Greek word tribulation all through the scripture. Every time you find the word tribulation, it's this word thalipsis. So he's talking about prosper is a narrow way. He's not talking about, I wish that you get rich. So all you do is you get forward and wrench the word of God when you want to keep the Bible in your life and look respectable. You can say, I'm a Christian businessman. And I'm making millions of dollars. I've made $100 million and I'm a Christian. I don't believe that. I don't believe you can get that rich. I believe it's hard to make a million dollars and be without twisting and perverting. I, I sold real estate. Most real estate agents live in the gray areas, which you can interpret it as black or white. They just live gray all the time. If you live in a gray area in your life, you're living wrong. Get on or get off the fence. If you're going to live for the devil, just go live for him. Fred that comes here. Fred. Fred was a biker. Lived in biker bars every night. Beating people up and getting beat up and getting his face smashed in and beating, smashing people's faces in for years. Saw me on TV one night. 
He said, man, call me. He said, you're killing me, man. And he started coming to church, and he showed up with a body cast from here all the way down to here, and he's come in like this. I don't even know how he could put his clothes on. And he's been here ever since, and he said, I live for the devil with all I had. He said, I'm not going to live for anything but for Christ the rest of my life. He looks rough. He talks gruff. But he's one of the tenderest-hearted guys, one of the best friends I've got. I would never thought a guy who rode with Hell's Angels would be one of my dearest friends. And he had a lot of self in him when he first got here. Some of the things he said, somebody did me wrong. He said, you want me to go break his legs? I said, no, we don't break people's legs that come here. <laughs> <laughs> Fred's grown a lot since then. It's funny I'll tell these things on him. I love Fred. But the thing is, he said, I live for the devil. Don't straddle the fence. Get on or get off. If you're going to live for the devil, go ahead. Go all the way. And as a believer, but when you're straddling the fence, you're twisting the word of God. I can do this. No, you can't. Your life will be miserable when you do that. And health is the word hugiano. H-U-G-I-A-I-N-O. And those roads belonged to the king because there was no other roads out here in these little villages. They were to take their armies and conquer the world or bring supplies into Rome, and you had to take care of yourself. They didn't build roads for you. Whenever you'd go from Jerusalem to Jericho, it was real rough going to Jerusalem to Jericho. Or if you was going up here to northern Israel, you had to go through brush and brambles and all kinds of, all kinds of stones and rocks. When Joseph and Mary was coming from Nazareth down to, down to Judea to Bethlehem, and Christ is born. They, it was some rough pathway down there. True roads belonged to the king. One of the kings, he said, if you didn't prepare the right way for the king, it was one of the, I believe he said it was a, either an Assyrian king or Abyssinian king, one of them. He said he come through this one town and some briars were sticking over the road and it scratched him. And he had him go into the town and get the king of the town and his son and bring him out and kill him. Whew. Just because you didn't clean the highway up. And when the Lord says, make my path straight, make the valleys, take all the valleys out, level them up, cut the hills down. And remember, remember, humble means tepanua means to level mountains and hills. And Babylon was destroying mountains and all idolatry, Revelation 17 and 5, here in Revelation 17 and 5, Babylon mothered all idolatry, was the mother of harlots, pornea. That means idolatry. Babylon mothered it all, and she was founded on let us make us a name. That's all the evil in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All the evil in the world was founded on self, one's own name. I'm going to have a big name in this business. I'm going to have a big name in this town. The word is shim. It means authority. I'm going to have to be an authority in what I do. People, going, Nobody's been more guilty of that than me. That's what you're involved in when you want to get to the top of anything. I've quit wanting to be at the top of anything. I just want to take care of the flock and feed the sheep and teach them. That's all I want to do. I don't live for next week anymore. I have no plans for next month. No plans for next year. When I get through tonight, you know what I'll be thinking of? Wednesday night. My mind immediately goes to Wednesday night after I'm through here. And I'm thinking about it, and I'm digging stuff, and I'm going into my notes and pulling things out. That's what I think about 24 hours a day. I wake up in the morning, think, let me see what I have to do today for the ministry and for the Lord. That's what I think of immediately. It's good to get your mind off yourself. When you got your mind on yourself, you get crazy. You know that? And the Bible says when that man, remember Delmanizamai, Demonizma, possessed with the devil, meant to be crazy, meant to be insane. 
And when the Jesus cast out self into the swine, that's what he did. And I believe what he was doing there in Luke 8 was showing us how unnatural this is for animals. How unnatural do you think it is for you? Do you think if you're involved in self, it won't affect you? <coughs> you know what it'll give you? Chronic bronchitis, COPD, chronic obstruction pulmonary disorder. It'll give you heart attack. It'll give you ulcers. It'll give you, well, it won't me. I'm young and healthy. Well, I thought I was young and healthy and thought I could handle it. Nobody can handle self. You want to live a long life, get out of self. That's the only way. Where was I? Health is the word hugiano. If you want to say that God wants to give you health, you know how many people are having bad health all over the country. And everybody's looking for a miracle answer for their health and for their money. So they listen to Kenneth Cope and he says, you can have these things. All you have to do is your ship will come in if you send me your money. That's not exactly the way he says it, but that's what he means. So you start sending your money for 10 years, 15, 20, 25, 30, and you're wondering why your ship never comes in. It didn't, I used to say it sunk a long time ago. No, it didn't sink. It never left port. You don't have a ship coming in. That word health is the same word as wholesome words. It means uncorrupt words. It's the same word that Paul would use when he would speak of sound doctrine. He says the time will come when men will not endure sound, uncorrupt words. So John is wishing for Gaius, not money, the well way, which is Christ, is filled with tribulation. You have to go through tribulation. We must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. And Paul said those words after he was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra. After they tried to kill him, he looked like he'd been in some bad car wreck. And they wrapped him up and put some splints on him and he went on down to Derby and then he came back to Lystra. Paul was running for his life. He was being hated. Now, all right. So all you do when you want to stay religious and you want to sucker people, you just twist the words of God. Say, this means this. Probably one of the twisting words, most twisting words the charismatic use, they call themselves prosperity gospel. And they say that you can have what you say by the vibrations of your mouth. And that if you say positive things, your mouth will vibrate and get positive vibrations. And if you say negative things, you're, you'll have negative vibrations. And they say that you create your own universe. Now, I don't know how that can be when the Bible says that God has declared the end from the beginning and from ancient times, everything that's not yet done. So if you're going to be poor and God wants you to be poor the rest of your life, there ain't no amount of talking going to get you out of it. Is it? Do I believe poor people without any great get up and go are supposed to be that way? Yes. But what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to help take care of them. Lily won't mind me saying this. This lady over here, she's gentle, very quiet, just loves this message, comes to the house all the time, wants to help get out the DVDs. Now, Lily's just a simple lady, but Kenneth Copeland's going to tell Lily, all you have to do is sit with your mouth and you're going to get rich. You actually believe that about Lily. I don't believe that. Do you, Lily? I don't believe it. She's a gentle, dear, sweet lady. Love her with all my heart. And all she wants to do is know the truth and know the word. Don't you oppress her by telling her that. If you do, you're going to have me on your case because I'm going to be her defender. I don't like nobody doing that. She's a simple woman, lives very simple. And we help her along the way. Now, I don't like nobody oppressing somebody that's poor. If you oppress the widow and the orphan, the Lord told Moses, you tell Israel, if you oppress the widow and the orphan, they cry to me, I'll hear their cry, and I will kill you with the sword. These are my widows and my orphans. Don't you do that. And then your wife will be a widow and your kids will be orphans. When I get through killing you and putting you in hell, Kenneth Copeland, you liar. Man, I hate that man. 
People say, you're not supposed to hate people. Yes, I am. God hates all workers of iniquity. He loved Jacob and hated Esau. We're not supposed to like those people. When they cheat widows and orphans, I'm supposed to like him? No. Don't like any. The Bible, love your neighbor, love your enemy is always agape. That's walking the commandments of God, 2 John 6. Agape means to walk in God's commandments. That's not just Old Testament commandments. That's every imperative mood in the New Testament. When, when the Lord says, strive to enter into the straight gate, the word is agonizum. It's our word to agonize. You, there's no choice in that. You have to agonize. It's an imperative mood. It's a command. If Jesus is commanding, strive, and he's the God that created the earth and said, let there be light, do you think the light said, well, I don't know if I want to be? This is my free will and my choice. No. Anytime God commands or humble yourself under the hand of God, to Panua, and we're mountains of pride, and Babylon was a mountain of pride. It was built on self. Let us make us a name. Self has to be cut down. That's what the word humble means. If self is not cut down, you've got a lot of learning to do. Is God cut me down constantly? I have learned more since I passed 60 than I've learned about how to live my life and all the rest of my life. I didn't think I could learn much past 50. Boy, the last seven, six or seven years, I've learned more about how to live for the Lord than I ever knew before. And the older you get, the more you just settle down and say, okay, Lord, whatever comes is okay. Now, where was I? I was talking about something. So every time you have an imperative mood, that's a command. Humble under the hand of God. Separate. Even the word be angry at the winds of doctrine. This is a commandment of God. You're not supposed to love Kenneth Copeland. Not, you're not supposed to phileo him, which means to have affection for him. That's one of the words that's been translated L-O-V-E. The other word is agape, and that means to walk in the commandments of God. This is love. This is agape, 2 John 6, that we walked after his commandments. Walked after his commandments. One of the commandments of God is being angry at the winds of doctrine that make the church apathetic. Be angry or gizumai is an imperative. That is a command. Every believer, when you start learning the truth about the Word of God, you're going to get angry at these lying false teachers, and you're going to tell people about it, and they're going to think you're crazy. You've joined a cult. When you get angry enough, I've had people come here and say, Jim Brown, you're too angry. No, that's because you're not angry enough. You don't know how much you're being lied to. Do you think this is something to get angry about, prosper and be an elf? Everybody's heard that preached by those guys, haven't we? It's an out-and-out -out lie. They'll say, if you say positive words with your mouth, you'll get what you want. No, you won't. You think Lily can say stuff and she can get what she wants. It's not true. <laughs> That's the same thing that Tony Robbins will tell you. I don't fault Tony Robbins. He's just a con artist. He's just a commercial con man. I fault these guys who's doing this in the name of Jesus. I hate those guys. They cheat and steal from the poor and the needy and the downtrodden, suck the life out of them. They live like billionaires. If you ever had, if you had, the way you want to see what they're doing, look up, just Google Kenneth Copeland false teacher. Google T.D. Jakes false teacher. Don't just Google Kenneth Cope and they'll tell you all these good things. There's a lot of people after these guys, and they know the truth about him. Look up, Google T.D. Jake's false teacher. He defends homosexuality. I believe he is one. What? I believe T.D. Jake's is a homosexual. In fact, one man said he seduced him in his church before he became famous, and then he threatened him, said he's going to destroy him if he told and then I heard him say one night comparing when David goes into Jonathan and Jonathan gives David his coat, I heard T.D. Jakes say these words. He said, Jonathan went in with David and stripped down naked and said, you can have whatever you want. He said, we are too homophobic. That's what T.D. Jakes said came out of his mouth. 
and I was so infuriated. I was so mad. If I'd have had feel a vision, I'd have ran that reached there and grabbed him by the throat and strangled him. You know what feel a vision is when you could reach into the TV screen. I mean, that made me. That infuriated me. I took about three notes of of note paper just on that message as fast as I could write. And I thought, this man is godless. And then I decided to go online and Google him. And this one guy says he's tried to destroy him and that he's had other affairs. Well, he defends homosexuality. He said David, he was implying that David and Jonathan, since they had a love that surpassed the women, that they were homosexuals. And he said that we're too homophobic. Do I like T.D. Jakes? No siree. He's got a lot of catchphrases. He's got a lot of scooting across the platform. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, come on. You could do it. All that goofy stuff, stupid stuff. And what they do is they wrench the word of God. They twist it. Reminds me of the verse over there in Second, Second Corinthians. Look here. This is what you can you can con the believer, get money out of him by twisting the Bible. This is what. Paul tells the Corinthians, look here. <laughs> Second Corinthians four. Four. Verse one. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced means to disown, renounce the hidden things of dishonesty shame and disgrace, not walking in craftiness, panagia, trickery, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Dolos. We're not handling. He's saying men are handling the word of God deceitfully, and I don't do that. D-O-L-O-S, that's the same word. Deceitfully is the word, same word as guile. It means to speak or live by trickery. By diversion, by diverting as though you're a magician, doing something with one hand and diverting the attention while you do something with the other. These guys are tricksters. And he's saying, I don't like the Baptist any better because they don't know anything about the Bible. They don't read. Look here in First Peter. And he's saying the same thing in Peter. What men do is they twist God's word Excuse me, Second Peter 3 and 16. As also in all his epistles, speaking of Paul, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned. Now, here's what men that are unlearned do. The word unlearned is A-M-A-T-H-E-S, amethase. It comes from mathetes. Now, when he says they're unlearned, amethes, we get our word math from mathes. Mathes. Mathetes is the word disciple. And he says, and Jesus said in Luke 14, 27, a man that does not take his cross and follow after me cannot be my mathetes, my disciple, my learner. You can't be a follower of Christ, learn and do the word of God, and truth is something you do. He that doeth truth cometh to the light. You can't be a disciple without a daily cross. What he's saying here, and how do you get a daily cross? Without a cross, you can't be a disciple. Placing the alpha in front of mathetes, it translates amathes, which means no Learning, no daily cross. If you're not bearing a cross, you're not telling anybody any, any truth. You can actually be a believer. And if you never talk truth out there to people, you say, Jim, that's so embarrassing. I know that when you start out, it is. But if you do it for years and get everybody in town to hate and you one more or less, don't matter. <laughs> Once you get everybody thinking, there comes that crazy guy with the T-shirts on. Everybody knows I'm the guy with the T-shirts because that's all I wear. I don't wear these shirts. These are to show up behind with this board. I never wear this shirt out in public. None of the shirts I wear up here I wear in public. Why would I do that when I can wear God doesn't love everybody on a T-shirt? Huh? Or Christmas is pagan or, 
uh, the reason the World Trade Center came down is because Israel celebrated Christmas 4,000 years ago. Put that on a shirt and walk around with it. Because the elevated celebrate Christmas 4,000 years ago. Oh, I've got all kinds of shirts that say all kinds of things. The best thing I ever put on a shirt was God does not love everybody. I never put it on both sides. Why don't I put it on both sides next time? Because, boy, that, I've had people walk up behind me. I was, <laughs> I, was down at, I was down at Sam's one day, and I was waiting in line. Some guys behind me said, what do you mean? God doesn't love everybody. I went, <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had somebody walk up in right in here and go, what do you mean? <laughs> I just, good night, man. Scared the life out of me. And I've had people, one lady got to yelling at me and Dave. We was out somewhere and she got to screaming and yelling. God loves everybody. I don't know where you come from. What does your shirt say? And boy, when you start wearing stuff around like that, you show where you stand with God. And it makes people furious. They get in a rage with you. I can't tell you all the incidents we've had. Whew. I have people all the time. I have a shirt that really confuses them. It says, I hate Christmas in parentheses. It says, I love Jesus. One woman went, what does that mean? Because she thinks Christmas is identified with Jesus. In the back, it says, Jesus hates Christmas. And then in parentheses, it says, Jesus loves me. And I've had people say, and I've had some look at it, okay, that's right, I like that. They know that I mean that I don't like anything that's going on at Christmas. They don't even know the pagan origins of it. But they know that's something right about that. I love Jesus, but I hate Christmas. Wear that and get some, you'll get some, I'm going to wear these shirts the rest of my life and have people hate me. I go in the bank and they'll say, you're the guy with the shirts. Went down here to to black eyed pea and, and, and to order a, uh, to go, you have to go up to the bar and order it. So I go up to the bar and start talking to the bartender. He says, you're that guy that wears those shirts in all the time. What does that mean? There's no accept Christ and there's no sinner's prayer. I proceeded to tell him that you can't accept Christ as your savior. And I'm talking to a guy behind the bar and he's saying, that makes sense, you know, and he's a bartender. He listens to me more than a Baptist preacher would listen. I'd rather talk to a bartender than a Baptist preacher because they don't have any sense. At least the bartender knows he's a sinner, doesn't he? I'd rather talk to a drug dealer than talk to a Baptist deacon. Baptist deacon are good for nothing. They're worthless. They think they were hired. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, where does deacon come from? They say, was that you? Okay. But they're not, they weren't used. They were Seven deacons picked out in Acts 6 so that the apostles wouldn't have to be busy themselves taking care of the widows and the orphans. And the word deacon is the Greek word diakonos. It was a household slave that waited on tables and didn't get paid. And he didn't tell the preacher what time to start or what time to quit and didn't hire the preacher. He had nothing to do with that. These are seven men of good report that took care of the widows and the orphans. Heard about one preacher. He got a bunch of sacks of groceries and stuck it up here on the front from one end of the church to the other and said, all you deacons come up here. Take these out and give them to the poor. That's your job. And that's your only job. But that was a household slave. He waited on tables. He washed the feet of the people because they lived in hot, arid land. And he'd wash their feet to comfort them. And they waited on widows and orphans. That's what a deacon is. So if you want to be a deacon, go ahead and be one. Take food to the widows and the orphans. Anybody can be a deacon. We're all deacons, aren't we? So he says, these are unlearned. And if they're unlearned, they're amethes. They're not mathetes. This means not mathetes is what it means. To be a mathetes, a learner, the Bible says you have to bear your cross daily and crosses are for being crucified on. That's not being laid on your house note. It's telling people truth and then nailing you to a figurative cost publicly and separating from you and hating you for it. But I don't hear any preachers talking about this, that you have to be hated. But everyone that's a believer here tonight and the ones that's listening, you must be hated before your life is over and God will beat you into submission until you learn to be hated. 
And that's because you need a cross every day. God don't let me get by without one. What makes you think you can get by without one? He says, if you're my follower, you've got to have one. You have to be hated. You can't be popular. Well, that's too hard a word, isn't it? I don't like that. You know, how do you have friends? We have each other here, don't we? We love each other. Well, yeah, but I can't be as religious as all of y'all. We're not all religious, are we? Does anybody here struggle with sin that comes here regularly? Uh, Dave always raises his hand. Me. That's all of us. But we love each other. We try to pick each other up. We try to help each other along. We encourage one another. We hug each other. And we everybody loves one another here. It's a great place to be. Did you know when you're out there in the world, when a man is distributing fortunes, he's got the demon of self in him. He don't love anybody but himself. Did you know that, that all those people out there that are rich and they're in clubs and they're at the country club, they don't like each other. It's always buzz, buzz, buzz. He's got this and I'll get something better than that. They're not for each other. It's like being in music. If you think stars are for each other, they're not. No. No. Well, you hear our stuff. You ain't heard us yet. What you? He thinks he's something, doesn't he? And then they get together. Hi, hi, John. How you doing? It's good to see you. It's hypocrisy. It's acting and playing. When you find out the world is playing an act, you're going to seek a nucleus of people that loves God and loves truth. And that's what we do here. We love each other, and we forbear one another. Forbear and that go. We put up with each other's idiosyncrasies and little quirks. I don't like the way he does it. Well, that's the way he is. Leave him alone. Don't like the way he chooses food. Well, he likes the way he chews. That's okay. We have to learn that about one another. We have to forbear one another and put up with each other's strange little things. Don't we? I was going to get to the... Let me just give you another word about... What these guys are doing is over in 2 Corinthians, the second chapter. What they're doing. What you do is you get forward and twist things. That's what you do. Do I have any time? Oh, man, I was going to get back to the Pharisees. I'll get back to them next week. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, the second chapter. I'm sitting here looking and not turning the right direction. Sometimes I'll be talking to y'all and I'll just kind of be flipping the pages and I'll be thinking of what I'm doing. Okay, second chapter, second Corinthians, verse 17. Paul says, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Men have corrupted the word of God. What they do is they don't throw the word of God away. They keep it and they twist it. They go wrench, twist. And the word corrupt is the word kapeluo, K-A-P-E-L-E-U-O. He said, we're not, notice what he says, we are not as many who corrupt the word of God. He's not saying a few. Many corrupt the word. Billy Graham corrupts the word. Charles Stanley corrupts the word. Kenneth Copeland, T.D. Jakes, they all corrupt the word of God. They don't have a daily cross, death to self, self-denial, being hated by the world. They want to be popular. They don't have predestination. They don't have be predestined to conform to his image. They don't have a daily cross. They don't have self-denial. They, they got Christmas and Easter. And they're unwilling to give up that paganism. They have accept Christ, which is wrong. They have a sinner's prayer, which is wrong. And they've twisted God's word. They have said, just because the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, that that's the method of salvation. And that's not. The next verse is, how shall they call on a God they don't believe in? Belief is the method of salvation, isn't it? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But believe is obedience. Because believe and faith are the same word. Believe is the verb. Faith is the noun. Faith cometh by hearing, and hear and obey the same word. So when you hear, you obey. You're going to do the word of God. If you're not doing the word of God, just saying it's not good enough, knowing it's not good enough. 1 Corinthians 8 and 1 says, knowledge puffs up. Just to know and have it come out your mouth is one thing. 
But he says agape is what edifies the church. Agape or charity, but it's, that's the word agape, and that's walking the commandments of God. He's saying, just saying I know the word of God and having Greek words come out of your mouth, that's not good enough. He said it is agape, because if you have agape, that's one of the words love, but that's walking the commandments of God. If you walk in God's commandments, you have to know them, don't you? So agape is knowing and doing. That's what it is. Knowing is not enough. Knowing truth won't get it. If you know the truth, somewhere along the way, God's going to deal with you to do it. Don't listen to me if you don't want to do it because you'll get too many things in your heart and conviction will get inside and you'll go, oh me, I, I'm going to have to change. And you won't want to because you'll still be wrestling. That outer man will say, I want my way. Paul says there's two men in Romans 7. One is the outer man. He serves self or the flesh or the demon of self. And there's the inner man, which is Christ in you. And God's going to put you through fire and trials over enough years till he's going to make you surrender and give up. Say, Lord, I surrender. And he's going to put you through all them fire, all those years until you say self has to die. The outer man's got to go. And you're going to vote with the you're going to vote with the inner man. That's the two witnesses to put self to death. It took two witnesses to put a man to death. And God's going to deal with you until. But Jim, that's an awful boring way to live. No, it's not. I thought that too when I was young. It's really exciting when you go out into a grocery store and you don't know who's going to jump your case. That's exciting. That's not, that's not boring, believe me. Boring is being a Baptist up at a Baptist church. That kind of Jesus. That other Jesus, that other spirit, that other gospel, that's the kind of Jesus I don't want. When I run across an atheist, which I ran out at the, out at the fairground one night back four or five years ago, he said, I'm an atheist. What does that shirt mean? God doesn't love everybody. I said, I'm an atheist too when you're talking about the gods of these churches. He's going, what? I said, I don't believe in their God either and their Jesus. And I told him about another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. And I said, as far as their gods and the ones you don't believe in, you're probably an atheist because you don't like what these preachers say. I'm an atheist with you because I don't believe in what they say either. Huh? Atheist comes from A and theos. It means no theos or no God. Well, I don't believe in the God of the Baptists. I don't believe in the God of the Church of Christ, the Pentecostals. There's two Jesus in the Bible, the one that says, take your cross and die, and the one that says, no, no, everything's okay, God wants you to prosper. That's Satan transforming himself into an angel of light. I don't believe in their Jesus either. If you run across an atheist, tell him you're an atheist too. That'll blow their mind. They're going, what? When he walked away, we were shaking hands, and he said, I'm going to think about these things. And I gave him a DVD. He said, I'll watch this. You see, an atheist don't, a lot of people don't believe God and don't go to church because of what's going on in those churches. And those of us who are elect, we knew it was going on in the churches. We couldn't put our finger on it, could we? I can't get my finger on it. How do you get your finger on what is this stuff going on? It's too religious sounding, but I don't, I don't get anything out of it. It's because it's the wrong God. Their Jehovah is not my Jehovah. Their Jesus is not my Jesus. Their gospel is not my gospel. Their truth is not my truth. They have another truth. And what they do, they do what the Pharisees did. They just take the word of God and wrench twist and they make it sound okay it's not I don't like preachers and I are one I really don't know a preacher in America that I have any respect for whatsoever they have got no guts not even John MacArthur tired of him thought I had a thought I had a feeling desire for him at one time John's got Christmas and Easter, and he knows it's wrong. He's got water baptism. He knows that's wrong. I've heard him say it. He's got his, he's got his crackers and grape juice, and that's wrong. He's got his pre-trip rapture. He's got his premillennialism. What is it I'm going to like? He preaches some real good predestination messages, and then he preaches some free will messages. John, get off the fence. And I would tell him that if I saw him. Wouldn't even, 
I have learned, quit trying to convince anybody of anything. They're either elect or they're not. Quit getting mad at them if they don't believe God. Say, okay, well, I'm going to have the last word. Let them. Because God's going to have the last word. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for truth. Help us to understand that we have to live this life. Help those here that are wrestling with it, that they have to live it. You can't just seek your own way. You've got to crush us under your hand if we're going to live for you because you said you came to the bruised or the crushed. We have to be poured in, poor in spirit. We have to be emptied out of self because you're at war with us while we're into self. Lord, I, I, I pray for a way to express to the people at Grace and Truth so they will understand and know that living for you is the best way to live. It's the most comforting and the most content way. I pray you'll help me to help the people to understand that. Let me express it in the right words so they'll see that living for you is the only way to live. God, we praise you for all things. Lead us to elect. Open up many doors for the ministry and we'll continue to preach this message. We'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. Well, that's the truth. Just as sure as the world. The demon is me in my life. That's hard, isn't it? It is, but it's the truth. Now, that's what will make your family mad. Especially if you've got a Pentecostal family telling there's no such thing as demons, no such thing as faith healing. My mother had